Commissioner Burrell has described uh, unprecedented access to data, deep integration of uh, cyber and physical worlds, wireless connectivity at broadband speed, and seamless access to resources in the cloud are transforming the way we work, the way we play, communicate, learn, and discover, of course. Uh, these advances are enabling an increased capacity to extract information, uh, reveal previously unknown correlations, generate hypotheses, and infer meanings from data. Of course, this capacity is expected to grow and is already disrupting the status quo across various sectors in our economy. Uh, we're using data to solve problems, improve health care and safety, and grow the economy. Uh, um, and one cannot underestimate that these advances have transformative implications for commerce, are critical to accelerating pace of discovery in almost every field, and of course have potentials for addressing many of our society's most pressing challenges from healthcare to environment to transportation, education, uh, public safety, and so on. Identifying uh, technical solutions and formulating policy framework uh, that will help us protect privacy and enhance the, the, the social and economic benefits of these advances is of course a national imperative. Uh, one that I believe CMU is well poised to address. With that, I am delighted now to begin our panel discussion on privacy research and public policy uh, with three thought leaders uh, in the country who are also a member of our faculty. I won't give a long introduction because we want to hear from them and also from Commissioner Burrell. Uh, Alessandra Aquisti is Professor of Information Technology and Public Policy at the Heinz College and co-director of CMU Center for Behavioral uh, Decision Research. Lori Faith Craner is Professor of Computer Science and Engineering and Public Policy. She is the Director of Scilab's Usable Privacy and Security Laboratory and the Co-Director of Master's of Science in Information Technology and Privacy Engineering Program. And Norman Sade is a Professor in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University, also Director of CMU's Mobile Commerce Laboratory its e-supply chain management laboratory, co-founder of the school's PhD program in computation, and also co-founder and CEO of Wombat uh, tech, uh, Security Technologies. With that, let me invite Alessandro to take the podium and make a few comments. Thank you, Farnam. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Good. 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 Uh, may I start by thanking again Commissioner Brill for coming to CMU and for what you and the FTC have been doing for privacy. I, I, I believe I, I speak for many years CMU when I say that uh, we admire and are inspired by the role that the FTC has taken in promoting a, a rational discourse on privacy nowadays. So thank you again. Um, my, my goal for these uh, 10 minutes I review is completely not ambitious. I want to change the way you think about privacy in 10 minutes. Uh, let's, let me rephrase it. Let me reframe it. Uh, I want to affect the way at least some of you think about privacy in the next 10 minutes. And by framing, I kind of, this is a double entender here because most of my work, I, I'm an economist. I study economics for privacy, the trade offs associated with protecting and sharing data. And I also do behavior economics for privacy, how people make decisions about protecting or sharing data. So framing has a pretty specific uh, connotation and meaning in the behavioral decision research literature, and is part sometimes of my work, and you'll see that in a few slides. But they also mean more broadly, in the non-technical meaning of the term, how sometimes when you frame a debate in a certain manner, you're going to influence how people think about the topic and how they make decisions about the topic. Uh, and sometimes your frame could be so, can be so strong that people will not see that there is an alternative, they will get a narrow vision, focus on your frame, and not see that next corner there are very good solutions. So I will uh, present you a number of frames or arguments used in the current debate over privacy, and I'll try to critique them and offer alternative frames, okay? So let me start with this. <coughs> privacy is a modern uh, anomaly. Privacy is a modern invention. Um, you see uh, very educated, smart, perhaps even genial individuals uh, claiming that. Um, the idea here is that privacy actually is just, uh, didn't exist in the past. Uh, our 
old, 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 old ancestors lived in some state of complete commune, communal existence with no boundaries, uh, no separation between private and, private and public. And then somehow, maybe when we reach the Industrial Revolution, maybe certain segments of the population, usually the richer, had uh, finally some privacy, uh, protection, or separation from the rest of the community. And now, due to the internet, where we are losing privacy again, we are somehow going back uh, to the original natural state of things, which is uh, no privacy. And uh, I'm not claiming that uh, people who use this argument are intentional to try to influence you, but think about uh, the profound effect this can have uh, if you start believing the privacy is a modern invention. You start then believing that losing privacy is not a big deal because it's actually the natural state of things. So we should stop worrying. We should just embrace uh, uh, invasive technologies because that's, that's the natural state of things, okay? Well, um, if you read the literature carefully, and by literature I refer to work in uh, psychology, social psychology, anthropology, and history, uh, you find that privacy is not a modern invention, it's not a historical anomaly at all. Uh, we have references to privacy in the Bible, in the Talmud, in the Koran. Uh, we have uh, privacy in ancient Greece, ancient Hebrew society, ancient Rome even in uh, non-westernized, not technologically advanced uh, societies, we can find evidence of privacy-seeking behavior. Uh, Tuareg in North Africa, uh, Java in Bali, studies done in the 1950s. Uh, the, the evidence suggests that rather than privacy being a modern anomaly, privacy, in fact, is a universal need of uh, uh, humans across cultures and across times. Second frame, people don't really care about privacy. Um, you find this often being proposed uh, whenever we see a survey claiming that people are happy to share or that Web 2.0 and social media are very successful. Uh, and, and the argument here, I believe, is that because people do like to share and because, yes, Facebook, Twitter, G+, are successful, therefore, people don't care for privacy. But if that's not the case, again, if you look at the literature, people have... Uh, both needs, they need, they need to share and they need for privacy. They need to socialize and interact and they need to have a private sphere. And it is not, these two needs are not in contradiction at all. In fact, you can find evidence of the two things happening at the same time. Let me give you an example. This is one of the studies we did at CMU. This was published a few years ago. What we track was the public disclosure <laughs> behavior of CMU, uh, of members of the CMU um, Facebook network. Okay, we started mining the data in 2005. We kept mining through the years up, up until 2011. What we found was that people on the CME network were actually decreasingly likely to reveal public information such as their birthday. So up in 2005, about 90% of people were publicly revealing their birthday to anyone else on the network. In 2011, the percentage had gone down to 10%. At the same time, and you would know it if you're a Facebook user, probably the amount of information you were revealing to your friends on Facebook increased a lot. So you have increase of private disclosure, decrease in public disclosure. Privacy in action. Privacy is about management and negotiation of public and private. So when people say, when someone tells you people don't care, well, perhaps the alternative is that people actually do care for both sharing and privacy. Another frame, privacy about transparency and control. And transparency and control mechanisms are absolutely fundamental. However, as I like to call them, and Laurie and I also uh, have both separately written on this topic, we consider them necessary but not sufficient mechanism for privacy protection. They are important, but by themselves, uh, they are not enough. The industry tends to privilege them because, hey, what's wrong with transparency? What's wrong with control? It seems natural that they are good things. The problem is that like a house without strong foundations, transparency and control by themselves may not lead to the desired behavior. In our experiments, we have showed how control, paradoxically, can lead to more sensitive disclosure to broader audiences because you feel you're in control of your data, you start taking more risk with your data. In transparency, well, we can engage in a slight of privacy, kind of like a magician 
mission does a sleight of hand, so we can give you the notice and we can uh, distract you so that we can nudge you to disclose more or less. In fact, something more powerful sometimes than notice and control is the default settings of a system. This figure, which we modified based on a famous figure that an IBM researcher produced in, uh, I guess, 2011 or 2012, shows how in the space of about uh, nine years, Facebook default visibility setting for different fields of data changed dramatically. In 2005, most information on Facebook was not by default visible to uh, other people or to the network or to the internet. In 2014, uh, the reverse. Most of the information was by default uh, publicly visible. In fact, remember the picture, the graph I showed you a few, sec a few slides ago about our study showing that information public disclosure were decreasing? I only show you part of the story. Let me show you the second part of the story. This is the same data, but a different field. Above was birthday, below is high school. Do you notice a difference in these two charts? Do you see what happens there? Between 2009 and 2010, something that, by the way, the FTC knows very well because they actually find Facebook for that, Facebook changed not just the privacy policies, but the default visibility settings for certain fields. Not birthday, but yes, high school, including others. So that by default, now these were visible. So you see people trying to reduce the amount of public disclosure down to maybe 20% for high school in 2009, and suddenly the percentage doubles to nearly 40% in 2010, because the default settings have changed. The last frame. Oh, I'm sorry. Privacy about control or privacy about protection from control? The last frame. You have zero privacy. And uh, I, I don't know if you remember, but this is an old, old quote. Uh, back in 1999, uh, Scott McNeely was the VP of uh, uh, Sun at the time. He, he made headlines. Uh, this, is a, this is from Wired. And he, he said, uh, get over it. You have zero privacy. And the idea is that we now live in, we're surrounded and using so many information technologies that there is no way to escape uh, Big Brother or, or Little Brother. Again, uh, think about the fact that, in fact, uh, we can do everything we do online nowadays with more privacy. We can browse uh, anonymously. We can uh, uh, go um, and use browsers which are more privacy protective. We can uh, protect our emails and our files and our folders. We can search in, in a manner which is uh, more um, protective of our personal information. Uh, the, the field of privacy and Nancy technologies, and we have great scholars here at CMU and other universities who be, develop this technology, shows that you can have the cake and eat it too. Uh, you can have privacy and you can have big data. So when uh, someone says this, consider this, follow, uh, this alternative frame. So these are the um, four topics and the eight uh, opposing frames. Uh, I'm not telling you which one you have to believe in, uh, but you know, perhaps the Privacy Day is also about awareness, and uh, if I succeed in at least seeding, what's the English expression, planting the seed of doubt that only the frames on the left are correct, if I succeed in only showing that there, are, there is another alternative, there are alternative frames, that would be it's success. It will make me feel happy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alessandro. Lori, please. Good afternoon. Um, uh, today I'd like to talk with you a little bit more about transparency. Um, it's also called notice and choice. Uh, this is some of the research that we're doing in the Scilab Usable Privacy and Security Laboratory. And there are a lot of uh, faculty and students, um, including uh, Alessandro and Norman uh, as well, who are involved in this research. The notice and choice approach is based on the assumption that people actually read privacy notices and make choices based on what they read. However, we all know that nobody really likes reading privacy policies, and very few people actually do it. A few years ago, one of my PhD students, Alicia McDonald, asked the question, what would happen if everyone actually read the privacy policies for each website they visited just once each month? Well, when she asked that, I first said to her, well, Alicia, that's crazy. No one would actually do that. Uh, but she said, well, but what if? Let, let, let's figure this out. So Alicia collected data on the average length of privacy policies, the number of websites users typically visit in a month, and the average American reading speed. 
Using this data, she calculated that it would take someone about 244 hours or six working weeks a year to read privacy policies. This is clearly ridiculous. Most people are not going to spend that kind of time reading privacy policies. Yet, the assumption behind the US approach to privacy regulation is that companies that post privacy policies will self-regulate and improve their privacy practices based on feedback from consumers, and consumers will be able to choose among competing companies with different privacy practices. If notice and choice has any chance of working then, we need to find a less time-consuming approach to deliver privacy information to consumers. Now this is not the first time that regulators have been faced with questions about how to encourage or require companies to provide information to consumers in a useful form. The nutrition label is a good example of a consumer information label that has been standardized and allows consumers to quickly find information and make comparisons between products. While most consumers do not check nutrition labels on every food product that they eat and every purchase that they make, they have learned how to use the labels when they want to make a comparison to check to see whether a product is consistent with their dietary needs. In addition, nutrition information is readily available to researchers and journalists and people who will use it to identify and expose trends and call out the really surprising information about the food that people buy and consume. Several years ago, my students wondered whether we could design something like a nutrition label for privacy. We followed an iterative design process with focus groups, interviews, and surveys. The result was a proposal for a standard format for website privacy policies. We've subsequently been using a similar process to improve the design of smartphone privacy notices and even simpler versions of website privacy policies. In this example, which you can see on the screen, you can see that there are 10 general types of personal information uh, down the left side, and across the top, there are four ways that companies might use this information and two ways that companies might share personal information. You can see at a glance that this company collects a lot of information, but offers consumers opt-outs for some of its uses, and doesn't share very much of the information with other companies. But even if we provide nutrition labels, it still can be difficult to find companies that have good privacy policies, or policies that at least match your personal preferences. So we also built a prototype search engine that lets um, people search for for uh, companies, and it labels the search results with privacy meters, which you can see on the left of the search results, those green bars. Now you can see at a glance which of your search results has the best privacy policy. After we built this, we wondered whether people would actually use this information. So we conducted a study in which we gave people money and asked them to use our prototype shopping search engine to search for some specific products. We told them to keep the change so they would have an incentive to save money. Some people used a search engine like what you see here with a privacy meter. Other people were given variations of this that didn't have the privacy information. Uh, we set up our experiment so that people did real searches. Uh, they had search results that were for real products and they paid real money with their own credit cards to make these purchases. However, what we did is we manipulated the search results so that they saw different search results at the top of the list. Uh, we set it up so that those at the top were the companies that had the worst privacy policies but the cheapest prices. This allowed us to test whether people were willing to pay more to shop at the companies with better privacy policies. And what we found was that when we made this privacy information explicit and very easily accessible, a lot of people actually were willing to pay more to shop at the websites that had better privacy policies. Now there also have been many concerns raised about um, advertising companies that track users across websites and target ads to them. Users often find this practice creepy and privacy invasive when it happens behind their backs and they're not given the opportunity to control it. In response, the advertising industry introduced an icon, the blue triangle you see on the right, that is supposed to indicate to consumers that the company is targeting ads and that users can click for more information and to opt out of targeting. You can see the examples, each of those ads has one of those little blue icons. But in our studies, we found that most consumers had never heard of this and had never noticed the blue icons in the ads that they saw. 
So we conducted an online study with over 1,500 people to find out what consumers understood about this icon and the accompanying ad choices tagline. We asked people how likely it would be for various things to happen if they clicked on the icon. Many people weren't really sure and they thought that more than one of these things were likely to happen. So in the numbers you see here, they add up to more than 100%. 56% of people said that probably more ads will pop up. That's false. 45% thought the icon was a sort of your ads here symbol and would take you to a page where you could actually buy advertisements. This is also false. Only 27% correctly realized that clicking on the icon would take you to a page where you can opt out of tailored ads. Uh, so that's kind of startling. More recent studies have confirmed that even four years after the introduction of this icon, most people don't understand it and it is not an effective tool for communicating about privacy options to users. We've also found that even when users do understand the icon, they are disappointed with their options. They are not looking to opt out of targeted advertisements, but rather they want to opt out of actually being tracked. The industry guidelines do not require that companies stop tracking users, only that they stop delivering targeted ads. To many users, this is a lose-lose scenario. If they're going to have to see ads, they would prefer to see ads for products they might actually be interested in. But if they opt out, they will see less relevant ads and they are still going to have their information tracked and potentially sold and used for other purposes. Another project we are working on now has the goal of developing approaches to extracting useful information from privacy policies and displaying it to users automatically in a usable form. We are conducting studies to understand what users want to know about privacy policies, what surprises them, and what should be brought to their attention. We are developing crowdsourcing and natural language processing techniques to semi-automatically extract this information from privacy policies. In the process, we're learning a lot about privacy policies and the points where they're actually too vague for us to be able to determine this information. In our next steps, we hope to develop tools for consumers that make use of this information. One type of privacy notice that we've been able to make progress on very quickly uh, is the privacy notices for financial institutions. This is because financial regulators have specified a model format for financial privacy notices. And you can see that most financial privacy notices look kind of similar, like this. So we wrote tools to crawl the web and collect more than 6,000 privacy notices from financial organizations. We parsed them and built a search engine that allows users to actually search for banks in their state and check out the privacy policies that they have. We were also able to run an analysis and find trends. For example, we found that there is more sharing from the larger banks and banks in the Northeast and also credit card companies. Finally, returning to the topic of Internet of Things, notice and choice is a challenge when dealing with these devices that may not have screens and may collect lots of information, including information about other people who are not the actual owners of the devices. We are starting to do research aimed at developing guidelines for how to create effective notices for these devices. We think it is very important that these guidelines be backed up with research, including user studies. We also will be working towards the development of command centers and dashboards that provide convenient control over data collection for many devices all in one place, as well as allow people to keep track of what devices are collecting information about them and how they, how they are using it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lori. Norman? Good afternoon. So I'd like to uh, spend the next few minutes discussing with you what I view as uh, possibly the most promising uh, approach in terms of uh, adopting the challenges that we face with the Internet of Things and scaling uh, the concept of notice and choice uh, within that context. Uh, and uh, in the process, hopefully, I'll be able to share with you some early success uh, in this area. Uh, about three years ago, uh, my group uh, decided to uh, look in particular at uh, mobile applications and gain a better understanding of uh, the extent to which people actually understood what applications typically collected. This is what people typically refer to as permissions, in particular in the context of Android phones. These are the sorts of uh, sensitive 
uh, elements of functionality and data uh, that uh, your applications uh, have uh, the right to access. And so, uh, not surprisingly, we found that uh, the level of surprise expressed by people when you told them about what these apps were actually collecting was uh, fairly large. We looked initially just at the top 100 most popular apps on the Android store, and what you're seeing here in this picture is a depiction of some of these results. So, for instance, uh, the biggest offender in this case was a, an app known as Brightest Flashlight, which basically turns on uh, the flash and whatever light might be available on your phone to uh, its maximum setting. And uh, people were very surprised when you would tell them that uh, uh, effectively, this app also collected their location. In fact, 95% of people uh, were extremely surprised and could see absolutely no reason for that uh, to take the place. A number of people we interviewed in the process proceeded to actually uninstall uh, this app. The point I want to make, however, is uh, a little different. If this is already failing today in the context of mobile apps and, and smartphones, then to what extent can we expect this thing to actually work using existing paradigms when we try to, sc to scale to the Internet of Things, when we're talking about environments where as you enter a room, there's potentially tens of devices, tens of services, all sorts of things, potentially collecting information about you, potentially delivering also valuable services in the process, but services that you don't necessarily see, services that you have no awareness of, in contrast to the apps that, in principle, you downloaded yourself on your phone, and uh, which typically will involve some kind of warning about the information they might, they might need. And so, the question that we're asking and trying to solve in our research is to what extent can we develop technology that will help reduce user burden, increase user awareness and control, and overcome cognitive and behavioral biases that often lead us, for instance, when we download apps on smartphones, to say yes to whatever the app requests, because all we care about at that particular point in time is to be able to play with that stupid game that we're downloading on our smartphone. And so our objective, really, has been to see to what extent, and we've been working in this area for about 10 years now, to see to what extent we might be able to develop elements of functionality that collectively we characterize as personalized privacy assistance. So what are those personalized privacy assistance? Well, the long-term vision is that I clearly cannot afford and cannot be expected to manipulate a very large number of settings about every single device, every single service, every single app that I'm going to be interacting with. A quick of the cuff calculation that we did uh, a couple of years ago found that if you had to configure all the settings on your uh, uh, Android phone, for instance, just with regard to privacy, you would have to deal with something like 120 different settings. And those numbers keep on going up as we continue to download apps on our cell phones. So the question is really, how can we develop functionality that will just inform us about the things that we really care about, the things that we might be surprised about? Can we develop functionality that over time we learn our preferences to the point that we can actually configure many of these settings on our behalf, and only when it's not too sure, interact with us in a meaningful and intrusive manner to verify that it knows what to do or to ask us for additional input. And so in an ideal world, this functionality uh, might also occasionally uh, motivate me to revisit some decisions I've made earlier. Perhaps I've changed my mind. Perhaps I forgot about something. And ultimately, this functionality should be very much an intrusive. It should be function that perhaps I would only hear about twice during the course of a day. It would just check something with me, it might warn me about something, and that might be it. And everything else in the ideal world, it would be able to do on my behalf. I believe that's the only way we're going to be able to scale uh, to, this, uh, to, to, to the challenges of the Internet of Things. And so one of the areas where we've been able to actually make some good progress is in the context of mobile app privacy. I'd like to share with you a couple of quick results over the next few minutes. So uh, just to illustrate the complexity of the problem that we're looking at, whether you have an iPhone or an Android phone, uh, you might have seen screens like the one shown here. Uh, so this is a depiction of all the various settings that have been exposed to us over the years. And these settings in many ways are good, because the truth is if you go back three or four years ago, we didn't have those settings. The only thing that was available, for instance, in iOS was the ability to decide whether or not you were willing to disclose your location. iOS has recognized that this was not acceptable and has actually made over time a number of additional settings available to us. So today, if you look at your iOS phone, if you have one, it's got also contacts, calendar, reminders, photos, etc. And for each one of these, it will actually list a number of apps that is requesting this information and give you the option of toggling on or off permission to access this data or this functionality by the apps on your phone. I see some of you checking their phones right now. Um, these settings, by the way, are far from optimal. Our research has actually shown that ultimately what users really care about is not just whether or not 
they feel comfortable granting this uh, type of functionality, access to this type of functionality in a vacuum, it is very dependent on what is going to be done with this uh, data or with this functionality. Is my location being used to show me effectively a map of my surroundings, or is it shown, is it being used to uh, enable advertising companies or analytics companies to build more detailed profiles about me? That will have a very big impact on how I feel about these things. And so even these 120 settings that I was talking about are actually very conservative. So um, one of the things we did early on is to see to what extent many of these settings could not potentially be automatically configured. Alessandro talked earlier about default settings. And so we collected preferences from people and looked at their level of comfort, disclosing a number of these permissions for different types of purposes. Internal purpose in this chart refers to uh, the app using this information specifically for it to deliver its core functionality. Uh, the other columns as analytics and SNS, social networking sites, refer to different types of uses, your information being collected purely for advertising purposes or for analytics purposes to build these very detailed profiles. And obviously enough, we found that not only does um, the level of comfort that people show vary based on one type of permission versus another and with a purpose, but it also varies within the population. That means that a one-size-fits-all type of default is often unrealistic. This is best illustrated by this chart, which you're not supposed to look at in detail. What we need to know is that the darker versions of yellow indicate high diversity in the population. That means that this is effectively your variance, and the variance numbers that I'm showing you, whether or not you understand how to measure these things, indicate a very high level of diversity. That means you would not do a good job by just picking one set of default settings. But one of the interesting results that has come out of our research is that actually, if you use data mining techniques, for instance, you can very often, and this has been a constant pattern in our research, you can often find a very small number of profiles of users or like-minded users that share, in fact, many preferences with regard to these settings. So in this example here, what I'm showing you is how well you can actually do at predicting people's preferences for many of these settings if you just organize people around four different clusters of users, four different sets of uh, preferences, if you want. And as you can see, the grand average number corresponds to effectively trying to put everyone in one bucket, and that gives you about 55% accuracy. Just with five profiles, I'm getting to about 80% accuracy. So that's a lot better, but we haven't stopped there. So we've asked ourselves, well, beyond these sorts of profiles, could we actually do an even better job by building personalized uh, predictors of people's preferences for different types of apps. And when we're not sure, let's go ahead and just ask the user, do what these personalized privacy assistants should do. When they're not sure, they should go and check with the user and find out what the user really wants to do. When you do that, we've been able to show this again, uh, based on very large numbers of users who are actually given access to a population of several million users and their data that had been collected by an organization called LBE. And we're able to show that, in fact, if you're willing to just ask people about six questions, you could predict their uh, many different settings with about 92% accuracy. And that number goes to close to 94% if you're willing to ask them 12 questions. So those are the kinds of results that we think hold a lot of promise in terms of scaling uh, notice and shows to uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, Lori has already talked about some additional research that we're doing in this space. Effectively, if you're going to inform users about things that they might be surprised of, you have to have the ability to do more than just understand settings. You have to be the ability to also read privacy policies, digest them on behalf of the user, and just highlight those few things that perhaps the user doesn't expect or actually cares about. Beyond that, and this is in relation to this uh, notion of command center, we've been also looking at nudges. And one of the things that we've discovered is that actually just providing people to command centers is going to be just as overwhelming as asking users to manage all these settings that I was talking about in the context of mobile apps. Those command centers are useful, but you can go well beyond that. And just to illustrate this again in the context of mobile apps, we've played, for instance, with 23 users uh, just last summer, sending them on a daily basis a single nudge telling them something like, did you know that your location has been shared 5,398 times over the past two weeks with the following apps? This is actually a real screenshot of a real user, by the way, in case you don't realize how much your phone is collecting uh, about you. And then give them a few options. If you want to, go ahead and modify your preferences. If you want to find out more, click here. And if you don't care, just move on. 
Right. Well, here's the last chart I want to share with you. Uh, this shows what happens to these users over a period of two weeks. And I'm not going to ask you to actually look at these color schemes and really understand what's going on, but you should know that every dot that you see is an indication of an interaction by a user either looking at existing permissions on their cell phones or restricting some of these permissions. And along the horizontal line, you have your timeline. So to the left, you're seeing the first week here where users were just given access to effectively a number of settings similar to the iOS settings I was showing you earlier. And these settings make a difference. You see some level of engagement, so certainly users benefit from that. But what you're seeing on the right-hand side in that third week of our experiment is what happens when you actually tell people, just on a daily basis, a single message saying, this is what's going on. Would you like to find out more? Would you like to restrict things? That makes a huge, huge difference. And so we believe that those are the kinds of schemes that you're going to have to see over time. So the final uh, thing that I would like to, you to reflect on is we often blame artificial intelligence, data mining, for effectively putting our privacy at risk. And there's no question that many of these techniques are behind a lot of things that you're seeing in the context of the Internet of Things. What we're trying to do in our group is see to what extent those very same technologies cannot potentially be put to good use and help us effectively overcome or mitigate at least many of these privacy risks. And so uh, this is effectively where I'm going to stop. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Norman. In the remaining minutes that we have, here's your opportunity to engage the panelists and Commissioner uh, Burrell in a conversation. While you're thinking about that, there are microphones on either side of the room. Please come forward and pose your questions. I'll start with a question. Uh, you know, we spent time talking about policy, technology, law. Uh, we haven't touched on education yet. And being on a university campus, it's a missed opportunity if we don't talk about education. This is in particular for Laurie and Norman. What do you see as challenges in education and workforce development, particularly in the context of privacy? And what skills and competencies are companies looking for in particular? What is CMU doing in this area? I'll start. Um, so uh, we went and actually talked to a lot of companies to find out what, what they're looking for in terms of privacy. And they told us that they wanted to hire privacy engineers and they weren't finding them because there were no privacy engineering degrees. And so they would find security experts who knew a little bit about privacy and they would find lawyers who knew about privacy but not about engineering. Uh, and so we took back what we heard from them and we developed the Privacy Engineering Master's Program which teaches both the technical skills and the privacy and policy skills so that people can figure out how to actually design privacy from the beginning in the products. Yeah. I think that's a very good summary. Obviously, um, th this master's uh, program is uh, partly interesting in the sense that as soon as we announced it, company came to us and said, when can you hire our students? And we said, well, we've just started to advertise. We're waiting still for people to apply to this program, but that's an illustration of how large the demand is and how much you can expect that demand to continue to go up over time. A big part of what we do in our courses is beyond just teaching the fundamentals, is we teach our students to learn by doing. And there's no better way of doing that. We do this in the context of our courses, with many of them involving projects. So for instance, right now, I teach a course on mobile and pervasive computing services where students work in team and they learn to design what we view as successful applications and services, trying to reconcile business, technology, usability, security, and privacy consideration, and forcing them to explicitly articulate the design options they've investigated and why they decided to go with one option versus another. Data minimization is a big part of that. Uh, obviously, privacy by design is a big part of what we teach. We teach these things in context, preparing, in, in effect, these students for the Internet of Things, among other things. Thank you. Please introduce yourself and ask yeah, the question. Uh, this is Pedro again, um, a privacy researcher here at CMU. Uh, Dr. Craner was talking about uh, the, this framework of notice and choice and how difficult it is to really make good use of it from a user's perspective. Um, so research has found that you know, standardized um, notices can help users to better understand those notices. Actually, people feel better at looking at those, like they think they can actually learn something from policies when they are standardized. Uh, we have also shown that some sort of standardization can help researchers to uh, provide better transparency uh, with respect to practices. So I would like to know uh, from uh, Commissioner Brill's perspective, 
what will it take for regulators to adopt more broadly, you know, standardized notices? Because I think it has been shown that they offer a lot of benefits. On the other hand, it's very hard for researchers to do research when those privacy policies are, you know, ambiguous and unstructured. Uh, and we have already seen, uh, as uh, Dr. Krenner mentioned, an effort from the financial industry to create such notice. It took years, but you know, they, they came up with something. So what are your thoughts on, on the use of standardized notices? So it's a great question. Um, you know, the reason why most of our cereal boxes and other um, food items have that label that Lori showed is because there's a federal law called the National Labeling and Education Act which was uh, passed, I think at some point in the 90s, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact year, but it was passed because um, there was a great effort uh, uh, in Congress and you know, with advocates to uh, try to educate uh, Americans more about their diet. Um, so there's a law in place that requires that standardized notice. Uh, the f banking privacy notices are also required by GLB. One of the reasons I am a big supporter of a Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights and baseline privacy legislation is because actually there is no requirement outside of those two, uh, sorry, HIPAA has privacy notice requirements and the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act also has certain requirements of statements being made if the company is gonna be collecting information, information has to go to parents. But outside of those particular sector-specific laws, there's no requirement that a company have a pi privacy policy to begin with. So the conversation about standardized notices needs to sort of, this is part of what we're gonna be talking about, is the interaction of the engineering and the, the, the technological concerns with the legal framework. I mean, the legal framework that we're operating in right now, unfortunately, is one where not everyone has to even have a privacy policy. So just, that I want to level set everybody on that. But I am a big believer in um, some kind of standardized notices. I'm a big believer in the NLEA, the, the food notice. I will tell you that there's been some research about that standardized notice, and they're not entirely understood well. And there are, there's some really interesting research that shows that those food labels are misunderstood by particular populations. So particular populations actually think that the more calories you have, the better, no matter what. And this comes into play now because there are um, new federal laws that require companies that have more than 20 stores or a certain number of restaurant locations actually are gonna have to start posting calorie counts for their menus. And the question is, how well is that even understood? So having said that, okay, th so it's complicated what consumers actually understand through these even um, you know, standardized notices can be complicated. But still, I do think that there's a role for standardized, standardized notices. And this brings me, I think it was you who asked the question about multi-stakeholder processes. You know, there is a way in which there can be some agreement about this. Um, you know, one of the difficulties in the mobile app setting, which was really about some kind of disclosures, it was more like the just-in-time disclosures about geo disclosures and things like that in, in the app setting. But you would, you would think that we can, through a conversation of a wide variety of stakeholders, come up with some ways to do this. Um, it just, it, it, it hasn't happened yet. Um, I think Alessandro has comment on this. I mean, I'm just giving the reality of it. Norman I'm just giving the reality. So it, it, it's clear that standardizing is not easy and, and, and there's always resistance from people who are going to look at this as imposing some additional burden on, on, on them. But as a technologist, I can say that uh, certainly standards would make many of the things we're trying to do a lot simpler. I would not view standardization as uh, being a sufficient uh, condition. And so I think the uh, issues that you were talking about people misinterpreting these labels, I would view it more as ideally a necessary condition uh, that agree. would have to be complemented, agree. perhaps with nudges, perhaps with additional functionality that would help people interpret these things. But if this data was already available in a standardized fashion, it would become so much easier for us to start developing this functionality. L yeah, I completely agree. Uh, necessary but not sufficient. I feel that way about a number of things. So for instance, 
you know, um, Lori and Alicia, you guys did great work on privacy policies generally, how long they are and how much time and money it would take to read through them all. And we've, we've looked at that research. It was a very important part of our whole, um, you know, in 2012, we also did a reframing of US privacy law. We did a big report and we talked about how notice and choice needs to be completely redone in this country. We need to have just-in-time notices. We need to have layered notices. We need to have information going to consumers at, at teaching moments when they're about to download an app or they're about to, you know, location information is about to be shared, just as some of the examples. And all of your work really fed into uh, those, that, that rethinking of notice and choice. But I want to say a word in favor of the full-blown full privacy notice. Um, you know, the, the, the um, standardized thing that just sort of lists a little bit of information, key information for consumers, is great for consumers. But when it comes to researchers, when it comes to investigative reporters, when it comes to us or law enforcement, full-blown privacy notices actually do play a role. There's another, you know, in, in for us to figure out what's going on, there's another important role for the full-blown privacy notice, or actually this may hold true for the, the standardized notice too, the, the, the short standardized form. When a company has to create a full-blown privacy notice, they have to think about their practices. They, it, it's an inventorying kind of effort that we like. We want them to be thinking deeply about what they're doing and what they have to disclose to consumers or what they are disclosing to consumers. So there is a role for all of this, which goes back to your point about what's necessary, not sufficient. In some ways, all of this actually is very helpful. Yeah, actually, when we look at the financial notices, one of the deficiencies is that the standardized notice, abbreviated, uh, satisfies the requirement, and so a lot of banks have stopped including the full notice, yes. and they should have both. Yes, yes, and that was an effort, that effort to standardize the financial notice under GLB was because everyone said, they looked at your research, they said nobody's reading the privacy notices, they're too long, so they said, okay, let's do the standardized, and right, and actually there was a rule, I think we also passed the rule, but it was passed by a number of the agencies that said, okay, you can just use the standardized notice now. But I do, I do agree, both are needed. I'm being told that we have less than five minutes left, so I'm oh. gonna ask you to ask your questions really fast, ah. and I'm gonna ask our panelists to provide rapid response. So, you've been waiting for a while, you go next. Sure, Blaze from Carnegie Mellon. Um, thanks, Commissioner Brill, for your visit and for the FTC's uh, report this week on the IoT, um, it's a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, so I think one of the most interesting things for me in that report is a discussion of whether a use-based privacy regime or a notice and choice-based privacy, privacy regime makes more sense for the IoT. And the report comes down pretty heavily on the notice and choice side. And it goes through a very fascinating and elucidating discussion about how do you overcome not having a screen, um, which I think for things like Fitbit, will work great where the consumer who purchases the device is the one whose private information could po possibly be compromised. And so I was wondering for things like um, if you're putting things in your car or a smart home or public spaces, to whom should notice be given? Who should have choices? Because it seems like it's not just the consumer purchasing the device, but the bystanders as well. Same, same issue could be raised about genomics. Right? I mean, if you're going to give, allow a researcher or a company to see your gene makeup, it's going to say a lot about your family members. Um, great question. I think we're going to, I mean, if we're, since rapid responses are necessary, um, I, I don't think we have an answer to that in terms of cars. Because cars, we'll, t we'll talk about not just the driver, but passengers and people who borrow the car, other, pe you know, other people who are driving it. Um, clearly, the purchaser and the user needs to be given um, immersive dashboards or other choices in terms of notice, but you're right, a lot of these uh, devices will give a lot of information about others. Uh, someone, you showed, the, one of you showed the Nest, right? And what, uh, what it will show about anyone who's in the home potentially. Or, so yes, great question. I don't think we fully have the answer to that. I think we have some earlier questions, some sort of preliminary questions that still need to be answered before we get to those more complicated ones. We're going to go to this side, please. Okay. Um, I'm Florian. I'm a privacy re researcher here at CMU. Um, you mentioned in your talk that people should think, or like manufacturers of IoT devices need to think creatively of how they can enable privacy. So I work on IoT aspects myself, and matter of fact is building privacy in is really hard. 
that's what I like to do, but it's really hard. So how can we incentivize developers in doing that properly and actually going that, putting in that extra effort? You gave this example, they don't even secure the data they send, and that's data protection. That's not really thinking about how do I minimize the data. And then maybe to the other panelists, the question, how can we help developers um, actually build these tools in a more usable and easy way? So, great question. One of the things that I saw for the first time at the Consumer Electronics Show was an entire section on products and services focused on privacy. Never seen it before. There had been products and services that were focused on privacy, but they were sort of one-off here and there. They now have a whole section of this show focused on privacy-enhancing and security-enhancing services. I think, now, I don't want to overstate what I'm about to say. I do think we're starting to see competition on privacy and data security. I think that you know there's a number of examples of you know the Zuckasaurus on Facebook, and you guys were showing you know some of some of that. I think that you're also seeing products and services that are solely targeted to that. Things like Snapchat, despite the, what I said in my talk, that's you know what they're marketing on. Whisper, other services. So I think there's going to start to be more and more incentive. I also think companies that are operating globally and are trying to respond to what's happening in Europe are also going to be incentivized to demonstrate that their services are as privacy enhancing as Europeans expect. So I think the global conversation will help there too. But I am optimistic that we're going to see more and more of that. I agree it's hard, I agree, but that's why you guys, look, I can't solve this problem. I'm not an engineer, but you guys can. And I think it's easy, what I'm hearing from companies that have long, like data brokers that have been in the business forever, what they say is it's really hard to retrofit for privacy. It's much easier to do it from the beginning, to be thinking about it right up front. And that's why you know, you, you've got these great people who are designing these programs, people like me to say absolutely go for it, because it, it is much easier to do up front than, than afterwards. Both uh, Alessandro and, and, and Norman want to sorry. chime in. Please. And I'm please. sorry that was too long. No, so please. Uh, this is terrific. Go so ahead. For, um, for an economist, I will give a very non-economist uh, <laughs> answer, which is uh, incentives are important, but they are not everything. Uh, people are motivated. There are intrinsic and extrinsic uh, motivations that uh, drive uh, human behavior. So perhaps one of the focus, uh, part of the focus should be on changing the culture. Uh, so that the social norm among coders becomes uh, adhering to these uh, best practices. I am not so naive to believe that this will be easy or that we will solve all the problems. After all, I'm still an economist, but I do believe it's part of the solution. So I wanted to say, and I think someone already said this earlier briefly, the vast majority of the apps, there are stats out there, are written by two guys in garage. Uh, the vast majority of the apps that you found on the App Store are the first app ever written by these guys. Uh, and so we have to obviously have realistic expectations about what they can do. But this doesn't mean that this is a desperate situation. The onus, from my perspective, should be on the App Stores. The App Stores actually have the ability to improve their SDKs and to offer a number of tools that will help developers. And there are very simple things they can do in, in terms of checking permissions, making sure people don't ask for more permissions than they should, uh, there's statistic analysis uh, technology that can be placed to use to automatically actually write privacy policies with a little bit of a dialogue with users. There are all sorts of things of that nature that companies that actually control these app stores could do to lower the bar for app developers to do a good job with regard to privacy. Thank you. Hi, I, I'm Norris. I'm a privacy specialist from Malaysia and I'm a Fulbright research scholar in the US for three months researching on privacy law in the US and emerging jurisdiction, particularly in Southeast Asia. I have a question to Commissioner Brill in relation to data transfer, uh, specifically on APAC cross-border privacy rule. Uh, one of the issues is in relation to the accountability agent. So what do you think about the trustee position as for the time being, because there's a report that, okay, what they have been claiming is quite deceptive. Because in that jurisdiction, we have been like struggling at a national level to determine whether would we rely on one accountability agent or more in terms of transferring data across border. Thank you. So I'm not sure everyone necessarily understands. I, I totally get your question. I got it. Um, so we're talking about uh, cross-border um, data transfers. There are mechanisms that have been agreed to. Uh, one mechanism that we have from the US-EU perspective is called the US-EU Safe Harbor. It's an agreement between the European Commission and the Commerce Department. You were mentioning the other uh, currently existing global transfer mechanism, which is through APEC. 
uh, the Asian Pacific economic uh, countries, which are, um, have developed a, a, an entire cross-border uh, mechanism. And one of the, and it's, a, it's more modern than the EU US safe harbor, and it has built into it accountability mechanisms, which include an accountability agent. The current, currently certified accountability agent is trustee. Trustee is a company that recently um, was brought under an order by the Federal Trade Commission for activities involving the EU-US safe harbor, not for activities involving APEC. Um, I think your question was, so that was just a level set for a moment, and I apologize for the length of that, but it, you know, this gets complicated. Your question was, how should we feel about trustee as an accountability agent in light of the fact that it is under a US order? Well, you know, one way to answer that is to say, you know, if, um, if you're dealing with a company that's already been through bankruptcy and you're a lender, in some ways they're the best entity to lend to because they can't go into bankruptcy again for seven years. Um, that's by way of analogy to say that trustee is now under an order with the Federal Trade Commission for 20 years to do a really good job on these issues. And I do think that, um, you know, it will uh, obey, you know, it will do everything it can to obey that order. Um, I think that it, um, is, it has a great desire to prove that it can live up to these standards. Um, I have no opinion as to like whether APEC should be looking for other accountability agents. I think the system is designed so that there won't just be one, there can be others, but at this point in time, trustee is the only one that has been uh, certified. But again, they're under order now. And I think that uh, they'll take that order very seriously and will likely try to do as good a job as they can uh, in their role. Thank you. Last question. Hi, my name is Chris May. I teach in uh, Carnegie Mellon's Master of Science and Information Security Program at INI. Um, last May, uh, PBS Frontline released a two-part episode called The United States of Secrets. And the first part of it was about the revelations from um, Mr. Snowden and the second part was what uh, in large internet companies are doing with, with the data that they uh, collect. Uh, this, uh, following watching that, uh, several of my students uh, pulled me aside and also brought up discussions in class regarding about saying basically that their trust in the government and in these large companies that they otherwise share great details about their lives with was shaken significantly. Um, what do you think can be done uh, from a government standpoint to kind of repair uh, this, this shaken trust uh, that some of my students have indicated they have? Shall I take that? Please. Okay. I, I mean, I, I, if you got, so I'm happy to answer it. I mean, I, I do think the Snowden revelations and, uh, you know, the revelations about, you know, what NSA was and other agencies were doing with data um, was a paradigm shift moment for a lot of people. Um, it, what it did is it raised the conversation, not just on the government side, but as you just pointed out, also on the commercial side. Now, I do not, uh, our, the Federal Trade Commission focuses on companies. We don't focus on government surveillance. Um, I do think, you know, it was a sort of a teaching moment, though, when we all could start having a much deeper and more meaningful conversation about all the data that is flowing and who's seen it, what they're doing with it, and whether it's serving beneficial purposes or not serving, um, or, or serving harmful purposes. Um, so I don't specialize in national security, but because I get asked this question a lot in Europe, I have an answer that I will give as a citizen more than as a commissioner. I do think that the um, agencies, the national security agencies, um, have uh, uh, taken, undertaken a deep examination of what they're doing and how they're doing it. You know, we were talking at a luncheon that we were having that the NSA um, has a regulatory and compliance program that is actually second to none in the world. They have 300 or 400 people that do nothing but think about whether NSA is complying with the rules. We may have an issue about the rules themselves but the question is in terms of what they're, whether they're examining their practices and really trying to follow the letter of the rules, there's no question that they are deeply trying to do that. The president issued a presidential privacy directive number 28 a year ago. He's gonna be coming out with a report or the White House will come out with a report next month to show what, how well 
um, some of the issues that he raised and wanted to have examined have in fact been implemented and looked at. Some of those things included the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, an independent entity, totally separate from the NSA, CIA, FBI, and whatnot. Um, it's been fully funded, it, the funding's been augmented, it has um, more staff now, and they are up and running and doing examinations. There has been uh, reports both within the White House and outside of the White House and within Congress looking at whether the rules that are in place ought to be um, modified or not. USA Freedom Act, other uh, pieces of legislation have been working their, with their way through Congress. I am certain will be working their way through Congress again. My personal view is that these things sort of move in a pendulum, right? You know, in this country we had 9-11, there was a great reaction to whether or not the agencies were talking to each other appropriately, and so we saw um, changes in the law. I think the Snowden revelations are causing a very important conversation to happen about whether there needs to be a pendulum swing a little bit back. Whether the result of that will be a, a political dis discussion, ultimately. But I don't, I think you and your students should know that there's a lot that's going on in the US to be thinking deeply about this, both at a, a rule setting level and then also at a compliance level. And when I go to Europe, this is a, again a conversation we have, and I often will say things to my dear European friends like, where's your PCLOB, your Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board? How many folks do you have within your national security agencies, which happen at the state level, not at the European Commission level, that are focused on compliance issues? Where, you know, where's your presidential privacy directive number 28? You know, what, what hearings have you had about what the member states are doing here? Which isn't at all to say that we shouldn't be having these conversations in this country. They're deep and important, but I think we need to have a reflection about what's happening worldwide. And the other thing I, I want to just mention about the pendulum swing is, you know, so now I think as a result of what happened with uh, Charlie Hebdo and in Paris, I think there are a lot of Europeans that are starting to ask some questions about how they should be shaping their rules and whether enough information is flowing to the appropriate law, you know, law enforcement and national security folks so that they can actually deal with some of these problems. I'm not saying that, they're think that their systems are wrong, but they're just starting to ask, you know, what is the right balance? And that's really the ultimate question is, have we struck the right balance? And frankly, I think we should always be asking that question. And we really need to, that's all national security, we really need to be asking those questions on the, on the company side, on the data brokers and all the, and the ad networks and all the things that these guys have talked about, the tracking and whatnot. We need to constantly be asking these questions about have we struck the right balance. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Commissioner, thank you very much for your service to our nation. Sure, thank you for joining us today. Sure. We very much enjoyed this oh, dialogue with you and for your thoughtful remarks. I also want to thank my colleagues, Norman, Laurie, Alessandra, for joining us, for your contribution, also for just being such terrific colleagues that you are. Again, thanks to our audience. Thank you for, for participating today. We're just scratching the surface, Absolutely. as you can imagine. Much more conversations and dialogue to be had. Again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you nice job.